If the sonic boom didn't wake you up, this might. <laughs> Actually, I want to read to you a couple of verses from the Sermon on the Mount, um, which kind of, I don't know, it kind of seems as a bit of a misnomer because there's so much going on in the Sermon on the Mount, it should be almost called the Sermons on the Mount. Uh, because sometimes Jesus throws something out there, maybe in one or two sentences, that is very much its own sermon. And I want to read to you one of these, one of these little mini-sermons he gives. This is from Matthew seven thirteen and 14. Jesus says, For the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it are many. For the gate is, is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those that find it are few. I find it absolutely amazing that this sentence that only takes about 11 seconds to read um, can have such a profound impact in eternity. It shows us that two ways of, of living are always in front of us. One is toward God and one is away from God. There is one path that leads to life, but there's a whole highway that goes to destruction. And while all of us have to make this choice, while every single one of us will have to decide which path we will be on, the environment around us is never neutral. Spiritual forces are at work in this world to do everything in their power to keep us off that narrow path that leads to life. And when I say spiritual forces, please understand that these are spiritual forces who have power and authority to influence things in this world, in this realm that we operate in. And one of the ways that this happens is persecution. And for the last 2,000 years, and especially in this last century, Christians all over the world have been tortured and beaten and imprisoned and threatened and intimidated and denied their basic human rights in order to coerce them to abandon their faith in Christ. The book of Revelation that we've been studying since September actually talks a lot about this. The dragon we are told, Satan, wages war on the Lamb and his followers. But we're told that Jesus is the one who is victorious over death. He holds the keys of death in the grave. And so he's able to promise us that if we are faithful unto death, he will give us the crown of life. Another tactic that these spiritual forces use to keep us off that narrow path is deception. Enter the beast and the false prophet that we read about in Revelation chapter 13. We are shown counterfeit miracles. We're shown counterfeit saviors, counterfeit gospels. And all of these things are constantly being peddled to you and to me so that we will leave that narrow path. And that we will put our hope and our allegiance and invest our lives into anything other than Jesus. See, in order to achieve his goals, and I've said this before, Satan does not have to win you over to Satanism. He really doesn't care that much about that. He does not have to win you over to atheism. He doesn't even have to turn you into what you would consider to be a bad person. Why? Because his only objective, the only thing he truly cares about, is driving a wedge between you And Jesus, that's all he cares about. And he does not care how that is accomplished. As long as you can latch on to anything other than Jesus, he succeeds in his mission. And you know what? This this tactic is very effective. Because we all want a God who's just like us. And if the God that we have uh, doesn't match our values or our morals or our priorities, if he doesn't excuse our vices, if he doesn't embrace the things we embrace, well, let's conjure up one to replace him. Let's find someone who will always scratch, our, scratch where we itch, right? 
And so we're given this, this large menu of religions and ideologies and philosophies and political affiliations, and we're told that it's up to us to find what suits us, what suits your tastes, what suits your sensibilities, uh, what works for you. We're told that that's the question, what works for you? The question of what's true, or who, who is God really, those are not questions you should be asking, we're told. But the way is narrow, and those who find it are few. Even still, there's a third way that we are being led off the path, and that is through seduction. And this is not really pushing us off the path, this is pulling. See, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus sets up this contrast between the narrow way and the broad way. And now we're being shown that same contrast, but here we have two different sets of metaphors. The narrow way we're going to read about in chapters 21 and 22 is represented to us, is shown to us as the bride. We're shown the narrow way as the bride of Christ and the the city of God, the new Jerusalem. Like I said, we're doubling up on metaphors here. So on the one hand, you get this, this, this female figure of the bride and the city. On the other hand, we get its opposite. We get the city of Babylon, the great prostitute. And the imagery here is striking, right? We read that and we kind of go, whoa, this is, this is getting interesting. This is no dragon, this is no beast, this is a woman who is dressed to kill in fine garments of purple and scarlet, gold. She's covered in jewels and pearls, and she's holding this golden cup. And her appearance is, is so striking that in verse, in verse 6, John says he's, he's caught staring at her. He marvels greatly at her appearance. But we need to see that we're, we're meant to see that is alluring she, as she is, the wine that she gives to drink, the wine she invites, anyone who would come to her to drink is toxic. It's foul. It's full of abominations. What she offers is good, and her destiny herself is to be destroyed. Now, we're given this vision, we're given this, this symbol of Babylon because the reality it represents represents a, a, a threat to the faithfulness and the eternity of every single person here. See, so we're, we're called to be faithful, and being faithful means being aware of the enemy's attempts to pry us away from Jesus. And so to, to guard against his, his tactics, in order to guard against being pulled away, in order to guard against being pulled off the path, we need to know what is being done to us, what is being shown to us. And, the, and the, the, this book of Revelation is meant to make us aware, make us aware of what's, what's happening so that we don't fall for it. The, the imagery of Revelation of this book is, is quite complicated, but the message really isn't. And so, to understand the message, I'm going to answer four questions. First, who is Babylon? Second, uh, what Babylon does? Third, what Babylon, sorry, what becomes of Babylon? And then fourth, what we are supposed to do here and now. So, that's where we're going. So, first, who is Babylon? Well, I'm going to tackle the first part of the image, which is that Babylon is a city, in air quotes, but it's not like an actual physical city. Um, we're not talking about a literal city called Babylon. As I said before, in these last chapters of Revelation, a contrast is being set up between the city of God, the new Jerusalem, and this city of man, Babylon. Babylon is a, a metaphor for humanity in its hubris and its, in its arrogance against God. Do you know what hubris is? It's a kind of pride. It's, it's this kind of presumption that, that people have that, that can be deadly because we don't realize what we're dealing with. We don't appreciate our own limitations. 
And it's, a, and it's a fitting word to describe Babylon because the origins of Babylon are, go all the way back to Genesis, uh, Genesis 11 with the Tower of Babel. And we read in Genesis 11 that, that humanity comes together as one body in this united effort to build a structure, a tower, that would make a name for them. They presumed that they would be building this stairway to heaven, and that by doing this, they would become God's equals, or at least independent from God. And God put a stop to it. He confuses their language because the only way that humanity can ever truly be one with each other and truly be one with God is for God to come down to them. They can't come up to Him. Babylon is about that that pride and that arrogance. But later on in, in the Old Testament, the city of Babylon becomes this, this, this empire, this superpower, and it becomes this great enemy of God's people. They, the, the armies of Babylon sweep in to Israel and they destroy the cities and they carry the people off into exile. Now, by the time the book of Revelation is written, that empire is long gone. The city of Babylon itself was just a ruin. Nobody actually lived there. It was just a memory. So why is this, this Babylon becoming this symbol in Revelation chapter 17? Well, in John's day, that the churches who would have first read this, this book, they would have immediately recognized that Babylon was a code for the city of Rome and everything that it represents. The fact is that, that Rome sits on seven hills, and here we're told that this woman sits on seven hills. So it's a, it's a dead giveaway. But here's the thing, that the spirit of Babylon, the spirit of Babylon was never confined to only one city or one era or one particular geographic location. John wrote in verse 2 that he sees this woman sitting on what he calls many waters. And at the end of the chapter, the angel explains that the waters you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. So this is not just about Rome. This is about the system, the civilization perhaps, that we live in that conditions every aspect of our lives. And we're meant to see that we live in a world where God is rejected and that spirit of arrogance is alive and well. We may not be living in the Babylonian Empire or the Roman Empire, but our cultures, the cultures we live in, are Babylonian in character. Our culture doesn't recognize God as God. We think that we can do it on our own. We can become our own God. And so, when it comes to the way we live our lives, we are constantly demonstrating that same arrogance. In the field of science, you know, at one time, um, all the famous scientists of the Renaissance and the early Enlightenment they saw the task of doing science as thinking God's thoughts after him, discovering God's workmanship in creation. What is science now? Now science is a tool. It's a wedge that is used to divide people from God. What is, what is government? At one point, people believed that the government was instituted by God in order to preserve justice, in order to make sure that evil was being suppressed. What is government now? It's not that. See, this ancient city called Babylon that, you know, is in Iraq, it's, it's a ruin today, but the spirit of Babylon is alive and well in so many ways. The second thing we need to know about this symbolism is that it's presenting humanity, this this the spirit of humanity as a prostitute, but it's not that kind of prostitute. Um, we're not, again, reminding you here that we're not dealing with a literal woman here. 
we're dealing with a symbol. This symbol is chosen for the city of man because of the relationship that she has with her creator. It's all about this relationship. Now, all over the, all over the world, millions of men and women and children are taken against their will, and they are sold into sexual slavery. Their dignity and their security and their safety is traded away in order to sustain the lifestyle of others. And the, the tragedy of, of sexual slavery and prostitution is just as prevalent today as it was 2,000 years ago. It hasn't really changed that much. It, it's here in Canada. It's in the countries you've come from. It's in Vancouver, and it's in Whistler. And, and sadly, many men and women and boys and girls face the horrendous choice between compliance and significant harm on a daily basis. For, for the majority of people who do this, to be a prostitute is to be a victim. But Babylon is not that kind of prostitute. In John's day, as there is today, there is a different kind of prostitute who, who, does, who isn't forced to sell themselves to meet their basic needs or to remain safe. They choose to sell themselves to meet other ends. Wealth, status, or pleasure. They willingly choose to prostitute themselves not because of anything anyone done, did to them, but because they believe that in sex they hold power of a, a certain kind. This is the kind of prostitute Babylon is. A woman who lures her customers in and gets them drunk on her sexual immorality. This is not, again, a literal woman. We're talking about humanity and its rejection of God. This is the spirit of Babylon. Why is humanity being presented as, as a prostitute? Let me give you three reasons. First, it is a parody of the intimacy we, made, we were made for. Now, a lot of people have this mistaken idea that in Christianity, sex is seen as icky or dirty. But nothing could be further than the truth. Sex is God's creativity and His goodness at work. So much so that, that lifelong intimacy and exclusive commitment to each other between a husband and wife is the defining symbol that He chooses to represent the relationship He is forming between Christ and His church. The whole story of Scripture is about this relationship between Creator and creation. We were made to glorify God. We were made to enjoy Him. And so this, this, in, this image of passion and intimacy and not holding anything back is meant to be something so beautiful that we would recognize when it happens that this is what we were made for. We're meant to recognize that the price of this kind of intimacy is that you give everything you are for all your days to your spouse, nothing less. That's what sex is meant to be. The prostitution is giving yourself for something much, much less. It's taking something precious and incredible and sacred and exchanging it for the profane. God made sex so that it would be a mingling of souls. Prostitution makes it a commercial exchange. God designed men and women to be His image bearers. Prostitution trades dignity and security for the price of a meal or a hit of heroin or whatever else. See, the city of man is being presented here as a prostitute because the glory and the dignity that humanity was made for is being sold off for far less than it's worth to lovers who promise nothing but material stuff and they'll throw in a good amount of abuse as a bonus. It's a sick parody of the relationship that we were made to have with our Creator. Second, this this 
image of prostitution is, is appropriate because our, our existence apart from God is at its heart self-abuse. It's not self-respect, it's self-abuse. One of the most unique books in the Bible is the book of Hosea. It's, it's there in the Old Testament, maybe in, in, in those corners of the Old Testament you don't read very often. Um, but in it, <laughs> there's a very interesting story because God asks Hosea to, within his own household, demonstrate what it is like for the Lord to be in a relationship with his people. What it is like for the Lord to be in relationship with people who are constantly leaving him and going after other gods. And so Hosea, he tells the prophet Hosea, go off, find yourself a prostitute and marry her. Start a family with her. Every time she goes back and sells herself into slavery, I want you to go and buy her out of slavery. See what it's like to be completely committed 100% to someone who does not even commit to their own good. See what it's like to be completely invested in someone who is on this constant path of self-destruction. The point here is that Babylon was made for something so much better. Humanity is made for so much better. But we choose self-destruction, and it's tragic. All of us were made for eternity. We were made to enjoy the presence of our Creator. We are made to know Him, and we trade that birthright away for what? We leave the path for what? Exactly. What do people turn their back on in order to chase after? Is it money? Is it wealth? Now, please understand here when I talk about wealth, I'm not just talking about rich people. People can be drawn away from God by money no matter what tax bracket they're in. You might say, oh, I'm only making 11 bucks an hour working for WB. You know what? It's still a danger for you. Because you have to make choices. What do I invest myself in? Do I invest myself into this relationship I've been invited to with Jesus, or do I trade that away so that I can get ahead financially? Are you pursuing your financial goals at the expense of your spiritual health? Because here's the thing. Whatever your goals may be, whatever it is you want to buy or whatever it is you want to do, what Jesus offers you is so much more. Whatever you buy here on earth, Jesus says, rust and moth is going to get it all. It's all going to rot. treasure in heaven, that's eternal, right? So why would you waste your time? Why would you trade away your time with the Lord to get more stuff? Okay, if it's not wealth, then what else could it be? Is it sex? I'm going to end up talking a lot about sex today, by the way. Um, sexual intimacy is a gift. But even then, it's, it's, it's only a foretaste of what we will experience in eternity. It's good for us to want this gift. It is a gift of God. It's God's idea. He, he invented it. Um, but are we valuing the gift more than the giver? And, and this is something that we need to ask ourselves, right? Because... The Bible holds sex to, up on a very high pedestal. It says, husband and wife committed together for life. These are the terms under which this happens. And everything in your body is saying, no, I need this now, even if that's not possible. When we believe the lie that I need this right now on my terms and what God says about it doesn't matter, we are not doing ourselves any favors, brothers and sisters. 
we have to be so careful about making sex or money or anything else our idols because no matter how much we love our idols, our idols never love us back. No matter how much you may want it, it's not worth your soul. It doesn't deserve you. You were made to be loved by God and to love Him. If you really knew who you were and you respected who you were, you would not accept anything less than what God has for you. Following Jesus means saying no to yourself, but that is not anything less than self respect. <laughs> saying yes to yourself at the expense of your soul is, is self destruction. Third thing, third reason why this, this symbolism of prostitution is, is fitting is because it is all about recruitment. Did you catch what was on the name, on the, so what name was on the forehead of this prostitute? It said Babylon the Great, the mother of all prostitutes. Um, think about that for a second. Now, they didn't use that kind of phrasing mother of the same way we do, kind of like, I guess there's a bomb called the mother of all bombs that the, is in the U.S. Uh, Air Force. Um, doesn't just really mean the really big prostitute, okay? This, this title, mother of all prostitute, is, is appropriate because this is not, prostitution is not just something that Babylon chooses for herself. Um, she recruits her children into that degradation as well. And this is meant to be a warning to us for every one of us who have grown up within Babylon that we have been targeted for recruitment. As I said before, all of us have two ways before us, the narrow way that leads to life and the broad way that leads to death. Babylon is the abusive mother who tells you that the narrow way is not for you. In order to survive, you've got to head on that broad way because that's the best you can ever hope for. You need to forget about God and you need to start looking after yourself, is what she says. So give in. Become just like me. Give yourself, sell yourself to whatever idols or whatever lies that you need to do in order to get what you want because no one else is looking after you. She says give in to your sin because that is who you truly are. Give in to your sin because that is who you truly are. And this is how human beings created in the image of God trade their dignity away and are recruited into Babylon's whorehouse. And the best word for this is abuse. And I don't think that the term child abuse is too strong to use here for what she does. And God hates it. Do you remember what, what Jesus said in Matthew 18 about children? He said, let them come to me. And then he says this. If you cause one of these little ones who trusts in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. This is the father's heart for his children. Now I want you to look at what, what we read about in, in Revelation chapter 18, about what happens to Babylon the mother of all prostitutes. We read, A mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a huge millstone. He threw it into the ocean and shouted, Just like this, the great city Babylon will be thrown down in violence and will never be found again. See, Babylon is at its heart abusive. So we should not be in love with Babylon. We should long for the day when the world will be set free from her. So what does Babylon do, aside from her primary business? Two other things. First, she goes after the church. When John sees this symbol of a woman, he, he observes, he says in, in verse 6, I could see that she was drunk, and she was drunk with the blood of God's holy people who were witnesses for Jesus. 
See, she crushes anyone who refuses to join her. If seduction doesn't work, if propaganda and social pressure and wealth incentives doesn't work, there are other ways of bringing these followers of the Lamb into line. Like we've been told a hundred other times in this book of Revelation, if you are living for Jesus, you have a target on your back and you will be made to hurt. It happens in every century, it happens in every culture, and it will continue to happen until the day Jesus returns. The second thing that this woman does is she allies herself with the scarlet, scarlet beast. She's in bed with satanic power. And together they go to war against the lamb and his followers. They are not at all tolerant of the truth. So they go to war. So what becomes of Babylon? What, it, what is her fate? What happens when, when this human empire and satanic power set themselves up against Jesus and his church? Well, they lose. We knew that. But this is what John writes. He says, Together they will go to war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will defeat them because he is Lord of all lords and King of all kings. And his called and chosen faithful ones will be with him. Think about this for a second. How does this battle go down? How, how does this war actually play out? It's almost as if the, like, like the, the Babylon and, and Satan, they show up. But then as soon as, God, as soon as Jesus shows up, it's all over. Just because of who he is. He never fires a shot. There's heaps and heaps of, of violent warfare imagery in this book, but it is decidedly one-sided. See, the, the dragon, Satan, goes to war against the followers of the Lamb, but never once do they ever actually fight back because of who Jesus is. He simply shows up, and they're defeated. And then, the final destruction of Babylon happens when evil turns on itself, and the beast betrays her. We read in verses 16 and 17, The scarlet beast and his ten horns all hate the prostitute. They will strip her naked, eat her flesh, and burn her remains with fire. For God has put a plan into their minds, a plan that they will carry out his purposes. They will agree to give their authority to the scarlet beast, and so the words of God will be fulfilled. See, evil, evil is left to destroy itself. So this got me thinking, okay, so what's our role in all this? There's a war that's happening, but we never actually fight. Never once are we ever told to take up arms against anyone. So what do we do? What are we supposed to do? We're just supposed to be different. Live for Jesus. That's it. Let me read you what, what, uh, what, what the angel says in, in, in chapter 18, verse 4. He says, Come away from her, my people. Do not take part in her sins, or you will be punished with her. We're commanded to come away from Babylon. Now, does this mean we're supposed to remove ourselves somewhere? Geographically? No. I don't think so. There's nowhere we can go on this planet that Babylon's influence is not felt. We can't leave. And Jesus prayed in John 17 that we would not uh, be taken out of the world, but that we would be protected from evil. So how is it that we, we, we answer this call to come away from Babylon? Well, we refuse to can't compromise. We refuse to live that life that Babylon wants us to live. We might still be geographically in Babylon, but we do not have to be of Babylon. We can be different, and we need to be different. 
I'll close with this quote from Daryl Johnson. He says, This chapter is a call to live in, but not of. In the city, from, for where else can we go, but not of the city. This is not an easy task. And this is why we need each other. That's why we need Christian community. That's why Jesus gives us revelation. The imagery sharpens the, image, the issues. He gives us this book to reveal what we do not otherwise know. That the great city, whatever its name, is not as ultimate as it thinks. It is always falling. And right in the middle of that great city is the Lamb, who is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, who is able to lead us in the ways of the greater city to come. Jesus gave us revelation to free his church from Babylonian captivity and to free us for the new city, which will never fall. See, this book is forcing us to ask some very fundamental questions about our lives. Which city are we citizens of? Are we citizens of Babylon? Or are we citizens of the new Jerusalem? How would you answer that? What does your life reflect? Do you belong to Jesus? Is is your relationship with Christ the defining aspect of your life? Or have you bought into the lies of Babylon that you need to sell yourself, that you need to trade away your dignity and your life in order to get what you need when Jesus offers you so much? Let's pray. Father, you are our warrior. You are our champion. There is no power on earth or in the spiritual realm that can match you. And we thank you that though there is a war for our souls, we we are safe in your hands. You created us, you redeemed us, and you will save us through the fire until we are in your presence face to face with our Lord for all eternity. Lord, we live in a very hostile world, and we are being pushed and we are being pulled off of the path, but I pray for all of us here, Lord, that we would recognize the attempts of the enemy on our lives, and we would resist. We would cling to Jesus in every moment and never let go. In Jesus' name, amen.